Thank you very much, Duke, for that warm welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You have just inaugurated your new 44th president. A magnificent occasion by any account, and I was privileged to watch it in New York just earlier this week. But it's one made particular in this instance by the very fact of an African-American inhabiting this, the highest office in your land. It has been whatever your particular political allegiance, and I realize that I'm talking in the Reagan Presidential Library, uh, but whatever your particular political allegiance, it's been a triumph for the continually evolving democratic process. For although the presidential campaign seemed to those of us who watched it from far off lands, seemed to be rather long and drawn out. We don't have the stamina for the length of campaign that you have. We normally get a campaign for electing a new prime minister perhaps five, six weeks. That's all we can stomach. But, <laughs> but you managed to maintain a momentum which astonished the foreign onlooker. But it's been part of the democratic process, worked out over the years in this your vast nation, and all credit to you for that. But credit is due elsewhere as well. The document on display here in the library in California has been called the birth certificate of democracy. And it's possible to trace the lineage from President Obama's inauguration right back through significant people and events directly to the year 1215 and the document you are displaying for all to see. It has a presence and a power that's able to move people today. Perhaps this was best expressed last week on, the, on its arrival here in the library when Robert Zucker's words were flashed around the world on the internet. He said as it was being unpacked, when it came out of its case, it sucked the air out of the room. I felt giddy. I hope that same giddy excitement will ignite the imagination of those who come to view it. That it may be an inspiration particularly to the school children who will come visiting here day by day. I trust it will encourage their resolve to hold its values and carry them into the future of your nation and our world for the generations yet to come. We at Lincoln Cathedral are privileged to have this great treasure. We are determined not to hold it to ourselves. I mentioned the rather lengthy democratic process leading to the presidency. It's in striking contrast to my own appointment as dean of one of the greatest English cathedrals. This process works somewhat differently, and I have to confess, somewhat less democratically. Now, those of you with children will know the torments of examinations. Many, therefore, will be able to identify with the events in my own household in August 2006, the day my daughter's exam results were due. They were not only her final school exams, but they held the key to her entry into university. Pride and potential both hung on these results. The atmosphere that morning, well, you can imagine what it was like. We waited for the time to set off to school to discover what those results were. Into such a charged atmosphere, dropped a letter, one amongst many that morning, through the post box. It was an ordinary office-style brown envelope, giving no cause for curiosity, until on opening, it was found to contain two white envelopes, addressed confidential, and on the back, the sender's address, 10 Downing Street. One letter was from Mr. Blair, our then Prime Minister, 
asking whether he might nominate me to Her Majesty the Queen as the next Dean of Lincoln Cathedral. The other was from his appointment secretary saying, I guess you want to meet and talk about this. That was the first I knew about my new job. I hadn't even known that the post was vacant, actually. So, back to reality, my daughter's results were needing to be collected, so putting the envelopes quietly back into my pocket, we set off for more important matters. Suffice it to say that all went well, and she's now about to finish her university course. Of course, that morning, she went off with her friends to celebrate. And I went for a walk with my wife and the dog. And my wife exclaimed to me with relief that now things could get back to normal. <laughs> Not quite, I said, as I produced the letters from my pocket. Well, so began my appointment as dean of this remarkable Gothic cathedral at Lincoln, thought by many, including John Ruskin, the great art historian and philosopher, thought by him to be the finest in Northern Europe, or as he said, worth two of any other cathedrals. And in size alone it outreaches most of them, being the third largest cathedral in Britain. Its beauty and its magnificence is there for all to see, standing massive and high over the city, watching and praying over it as it has done for more than 900 years. But it wasn't until I arrived in Lincoln that I learned that I was not only the possessor of one of the greatest cathedrals, but I was also the owner of Magna Carta, one of the four remaining original documents from 1215. And over these past two years, I've come to understand something of that responsibility. Hence the title of my lecture this morning, To Have But Not to hold. For those of you who don't know the geography of Britain terribly well, Lincoln Cathedral is situated in the city of Lincoln, not as some of your media reported this week in London. Lincoln is on the east side of England, about 150 miles north of London. It takes its name neither from an automobile nor from a president. In fact, it takes its name from Roman times in Britain. It was a key Roman settlement, situated at the crossroads, where two of Britain's main Roman roads actually met. Ermine Street, coming up from London to the north, and coming up from the southwest, the Foss Way, and they met at Lincoln. It was, as I say, a Roman settlement originally called Lindum Colonium, hence Lincoln. And that was established at this junction, this meeting point. The city today still has many Roman ruins to be seen, including the only third century Roman arch still to be used as a traffic thoroughfare. Well, many centuries later, after the Romans had left Britain, in, 1076, in 1066, William I came over from Normandy and came and conquered Britain, known as William the Conqueror. Well, a few years after he'd established himself, he was trying to sort out his power base across the land. And so in 1072, he instructed his cousin, Bishop Remigius, to move his cathedral that he had in Dorchester-on-Thames, just west of London, to move it up to Lincoln and to build there a new cathedral and a new castle and to establish his power base in the middle of Britain. So he had a power base in London and a power base in Lincoln. Now both the cathedral and the castle remain to this day. Though the cathedral first built in the Romanesque style, was then shrouded with the great Gothic style. And what was probably a medium size, although a large building in those days, is now a massive building as the great Gothic cathedral was built around the original. The cathedral was enlarged in 1187 
and then had a modern extension put on in 1260. Now, this new East End was built to house the shrine of our saint at Lincoln, St. Hugh, who'd been Bishop of Lincoln and died in 1200. He'd been a great builder himself, enlarging the cathedral, but also he was a deeply respected statesman. He had stood up to kings of England, been appointed by Henry II, Richard I, he stood up to him, and then King John. Many kings and statesmen attended his funeral at Lincoln, and amongst the pallbearers of his coffin was John, King of England, in 1200. Had John been wise enough to remember what Hugh had told him, perhaps we should not be here today. Perhaps there would have been no need for Magna Carta. King John had been insecure in many ways and sought to bolster his political power through his battles abroad. Regrettably, he was spectacularly unsuccessful in this, and his hopeless attempts to recover lost territories only exacerbated his problems at home. He was always in need of ever-increasing funds for his wars, a familiar story throughout every generation, sadly. And the burden fell upon those who were paying taxes or providing armies. The barons of England were growing impatient. The burden which was ever growing was falling on their shoulders, and John seemed to lack either the political or the social skills to keep them on his side. Finally, things came to a head, and in a confrontation at Runnymede in 1215, King John was forced to accept the terms that the barons were demanding of him. These articles of the barons, as they were first called, covered a number of issues which had caused resentment, but essentially what they were doing was putting a check on the power of the king. And in doing so, they began something that leads us right down to the present day. The agreement was written down, and although people speak of King John being forced to sign Magna Carta, it was in fact authorized by his seal being attached to it. When I say it, I should perhaps say them, for before the days of email and so on, the laws had to be copied out onto documents, onto parchment, and then they would be sent out to the various power centers around the nation. And so we think that probably there will have been around 30 or so Magna Carta, the scribes immediately copying them as soon as the deal had been struck, the seal of the king being attached, and then they were sent off to the different places. And so Magna Carta came to Lincoln, and if you turn over, though please don't, if you turn over the Magna Carta in the showcase here, you will find written on the back, Lincolnia, to make sure that it got to Lincoln. And it will have arrived in Lincoln a few days after it was signed, sealed in June 1215. I like to think of it romantically being folded up because it's got creases in it. You can see the creases. I think it was folded up by uh, Bishop Hugh, a subsequent bishop, Hugh, not the saint, this is Hugh de Wells, and he put it in his saddlebag and rode back to Lincoln and arrived up the steep hill waving this document because he himself had been one of the witnesses at Runnymede. And you'll see his name, I think it's in the second line on the right-hand side. And so it came to Lincoln, and it has remained there for almost eight centuries. For much of that time, it lay undisturbed and unnoticed in the bottom of a drawer. It wasn't until the early 19th century that people became aware of this extraordinary treasure they had in their midst. Even then, it was brought out and just hung on a wall in one of the offices. So when conservators argue today about how best to preserve such ancient documents, 
I say leave it in the bottom of a drawer for about four or five hundred years and it'll be fine. But then we do want people to share in seeing it. So we have to take the greatest care we can in managing it. And you'll know something of the strict measures involved in bringing that document across the Atlantic and across your country to here. Even though I can say I have Magna Carta, I dare not hold it myself. I leave that to our conservator. Again, to have, but not to hold. Now, the document acquired the name Magna Carta, the Great Charter, to distinguish it from another legal agreement, the Lesser Charter, or the Charter of the Forest, dating from 1270. And this dealt with the rights of the ordinary person to use the forests for gathering firewood, for getting the essentials for simple domestic life. Up to then, the king could declare areas the king's forest, and those whose livelihoods had depended upon a particular area of woodland found themselves liable to prosecution and even perhaps death for trespass and theft. And so to secure their ancient rights, this agreement further limited the king's indiscriminate power. And so emerged the name Magna Carta to distinguish it from the lesser charter, the charter of the forest. Only two copies of this lesser charter survive today. And I'm proud to say Lincoln Cathedral has one of the two remaining. So we have the original Magna Carta, the original lesser charter in Lincoln Cathedral. Of course, you'll know that King John soon reneged on his agreement with the barons, and he asked the Pope to annul it. And so the original Magna Carta Agreement of 1215 had the force of law for only a few months. But something had happened in that meadow at Runnymede that wasn't going to be stopped. A spring of hope had welled up, which in due time was to become what President Reagan described as one of the springs from which the great river of human freedom rises. King John, however, was dead within a short while, dying near Lincoln at Newark Castle. But Magna Carta was to live on. It was reissued in slightly altered form by in the name of his successor, the young King Henry III. In 1216, and then again in 1217, each time trying to placate the barons, those who wanted to keep a check on the regal power. And then later in 1225, Henry again issued a shortened version, which was enshrined in English law by Edward I in 1297. And it was a copy of the 1297 edition that was sold a couple of years ago here in America by Ross Perot. So you've got different Magna Carta, the one over here that uh, used to be in Capitol Hill, that is from 1297. But the one you have here today dates from the original 1215. Magna Carta came to prominence again in British history at the time of King Charles I. You may recall that he was executed in 1649 following the Civil War. And once again, at the heart of the matter, was the nature of power held by a ruler. Charles had adopted the philosophy of the divine right of kings, by which he felt entitled to govern. The tradition exemplified by Magna Carta had emphasized that his right to govern lay with the agreement of the people, that is, parliament, or earlier, the barons. One of the leading figures of Charles's time, Sir Thomas Cook, declared that the king's authority may be God-given, but his power of government was limited by parliament under the rule of law. Looking back to Magna Carta, Cook said famously, Magna Carta is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign. Of course, we find this issue re-emerging throughout history. 
It's perhaps something of this that lay behind the resignation of President Nixon. In seeking to govern as he thought best, he went beyond the law. And Magna Carta rebukes any who would set themselves above the rule of law. Magna Carta has become a symbol far, far greater than its original purpose. An agreement between the powerful barons of the land and their monarch became instead a symbol of the freedom and rights of the individual, however lowly. It was the spirit of Magna Carta which was engraved on the hearts of those first brave settlers who set out from England. A number of them, like John Smith, first governor of Virginia, came from Lincolnshire. It was to Magna Carta that William Penn, founder of the Quaker colony, appealed at his trial at the Old Bailey in London, and he incorporated it in a tract that he published in 1687. Clauses from Magna Carta were to be incorporated in the charters of several colonies here. And as the tensions grew between your people and my people, so it was to Magna Carta that many of the colonial lawyers turned. Even the cry, no taxation without representation, was claimed to be rooted in the principles of Magna Carta. Those high ideals and values percolated down through the ages and resulted in your Declaration of Independence, in your American Constitution, we see it influencing Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. We see it sustaining the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights can properly trace its origins back to running. In all this, Magna Carta is a beacon, an icon, a reference point for individual freedom and the values espoused by both our nations. Again, to quote President Reagan, our joint love of liberty was spawned by a common heritage. It was English history and tradition with the Magna Carta and the common law which gave birth to our Declaration of Independence. It was men of enormous intellectual capacity and courage whose powerful ideas fed our notions of indiv individual freedom and the dignity of all people. But how far is this icon of freedom myth rather than reality? What did Magna Carta actually say? Much of it was caught up with particular issues facing the barons at that time. Of course, it dealt with certain things necessary to the heart of any society. Look at paragraph 35. Let there be one measure of wine throughout our kingdom and one measure of ale, one measure of corn and one width of cloth. Let it be the same with weights as with measures. Basic to any society, not just ale and wine, but an agreement of a general understanding of weights and measures to allow for fair trade and human interaction. It establishes common practice to undergird communal life. So there was something so basic, so obvious there in Magna Carta. That sense of commonly agreed principles was also turned towards the system of justice. It may sound odd to us today that it should have been necessary to put in paragraph 45. We will not make justices, constables, sheriffs, or bailiffs who do not know the law of the land and mean to observe it well. Clearly, there was a concern at the quality of people engaged in administering justice. You see, where the king was himself the law, his minions at whatever level might claim his authority. And so you had people who had no real idea of what was right or what was wrong. They just said, we are the king's men. And then they did as they thought fit, as whatever they wanted to do. Magna Carta tried to put a stop to that. It said, if the law has an existence in its own right, then its executors 
need to refer to the law alone and hence be properly acquainted with it and so administer it. And then there are other things. There were issues of inheritance, the question of whether widows could be forced to remarry, with money lending and repayment, and many other matters of moment. But perhaps the concerns which resonate today for us are to do with freedom and justice. The very first paragraph, and interestingly enough, the very last paragraph, both promise that the English church shall be free. Of course, the history in England shows this developing along a delicate path between being an established church since Henry VIII's time and yet holding still this cherished freedom. Here in your country, the separation between church and state ensures, again, that sense of freedom. But the contemporary challenge to both of us is to that freedom of religion, which many would espouse, but which we've found compromised in prejudice by popular perception of much of today's world's tensions. After the atrocities of 9-11 here, and then the later July bombings throughout London, there was a great suspicion, for example, of the Islamic communities in our Western world. The need to affirm freedom of religion was essential at a time when fear fueled prejudice based upon ignorance. Freedoms then, freedoms today. One ancient freedom guaranteed by Magna Carta in paragraph 13 and still in place today concerns the freedom of the city of London. The city, which some of you will know is a small square mile, lies within but is independent of the greater London metropolis. And the city is always jealously guarded its ancient rights. And this has established and allowed itself to achieve its position as a world center for trade and commerce. Perhaps it's also allowed it to develop the unreal expectations of growth which we've seen come to grief in our present economic life. But it's the freedom of the individual and the right to justice that lies most deeply in Magna Carta's relevance for us today. No free man shall be taken or imprisoned or disseised, that means dispossessed, or outlawed or exiled or in any way ruined, nor will we go or send against him except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Paragraph 39. No false imprisonment. Trial by jury by twelve just men or women under the law of the land. That is what was secured here in 1215. It found its way into your constitution in the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. To no one will we sell, to no one will we delay or deny right or justice. Paragraph 40. To withhold justice was as bad as being unjust. Arising from these and the surrounding paragraphs comes the right of habeas corpus, a key feature of our current laws, yet one that is under threat today as we know. They find further expression in Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, stating everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. One of my former colleagues at Lincoln, Professor Mike West, speaks of the stain on the character of both our nations with regard to these liberties denied by the slave trade in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries. The work of William Wilberforce in Britain and Abraham Lincoln's Emancipatory Proclamation of 1863, these were key in the eventual abolition of the slave trade. But then Mike, my colleague, went on to say, it's likely that both Abraham Lincoln and William Wilberforce would be horrified by the extent to which slavery still exists in our world today. 
as a legally permitted labor system, traditional slavery has been abolished everywhere, if not completely stamped out. However, today the word slavery covers a variety of human rights issues that include the sale of children, child prostitution or pornography, the exploitation of child labor, the use of children in armed conflict, debt bondage, sex trafficking, the exploitation of prostitution. Slavery-like practices are often clandestine, but evidence compiled by the United Nations human rights bodies suggests that these practices are vast and widespread. Magna Carta still has much to say today. And another place where the shoe pinches today concerns this selling or delaying of justice. Now I'm sure that all would agree that in theory this has no place in a healthy society. Yet in my own country, many of our leading lawyers are concerned that access to justice is not as free as we might claim. It's said that only the very rich or the very poor can afford to go to justice. For the fees incurred are expensive and deter many people. Those with no money may seek legal aid. But here inevitably the costs to the state purse are enormous. And so there are proposed restrictions on this. And these in turn threaten the rights to justice advocated for all. Again in our litigious age, many settlements are made out of court and far removed from justice, purely again because of the costs involved. It's sadly often cheaper to pay undeserved damages than to meet the costs of fighting a demand in court. This complex and alarming result contradicts the essence of Magna Carta. But perhaps the most alarming challenge to Magna Carta in our own age has come from the threat and the actuality of terrorism. It is the very nature of terrorism that it strikes at the heart of, a, of society's values with the weapon of fear. Its hope is the destabilization of society. Its victory is when our obsession with that fear makes us lose sight of and compromise our basic values. To many observers, this is the struggle we have in both our countries. My own country, possibly the most watched nation in the free world, with surveillance ca cameras monitoring, even intruding, on the individual's every moment. In the name of security, we've moved near to the patterns of the communist and other repressive regimes known across our world. In your own country, the continued existence of Guantanamo Bay, though I see there's hope that that is now to be closed, but the continued existence of that stands as a contradiction to the laws of Magna Carta. Now we know the threat and the fear, and we can see the reasons for beginning to change our basic traditions, but it's always hard to call a halt, to find an end. But if we don't, then something has been lost to us, and a victory has been won by the terrorists. In my own country, there was recently a very heated debate about the length of time a suspect could be held without charge. The government wanted to introduce a time uh, to increase it from 27 days or however many to 42 days. In the hysteria of the terrorist threat, many were persuaded. Our House of Commons voted for it, evoking the cry from the veteran Member of Parliament, Tony Benn, who said, I never thought I would live to see the day when Magna Carta was repealed in the House of Commons. But it survived because the upper chamber, the House of Lords, threw it out. Influenced, interestingly enough, by a maiden speech from the recently retired head of our security and secret services opposing such an extension. It was against the background of this debate last year that one of our foremost judges in Britain, Baroness Butler Schloss, came to Lincoln Cathedral to deliver the annual Magna Carta lecture. And in this, she quoted a former Lord Chancellor, Lord Falconer, who said, the rule of law 
must prevail just as much in times of terror as in times of peace. And then she quoted Justice Kennedy of your Supreme Court. The laws and constitution are designed to survive and remain in force in extraordinary times. She went on to say, that is a sentiment which derives from the philosophy of Magna Carta. But it means that judges, from time to time, make decisions which are unpopular both with the government and with the public. We pride ourselves that we have a civilized country and we have exported our concept of the rule of law right around the world. It would be a sad day if we were to fall seriously below the standards we have set ourselves and which we expect of other countries, especially emerging countries with newly constituted legal systems. We have, however, only to read about the problems in some other countries where judges are not allowed to be independent to recognize the importance of upholding the rule of law. Again, one might turn here to words of Benjamin Franklin. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Perhaps the most significant result of Magna Carta, both in 1215 and subsequently, lay in one of its final paragraphs, number 61, which established a sort of court or council of barons who could hold the king to account if he defaulted on any of the agreements made. It was, if you like, a precursor to today's accountability. It was perhaps the thing that annoyed King John most of all. Not only was he to be under the law, but he was to be accountable under the law to his subjects. He and some of his successors tried to ignore this, but in the end, the idea was too powerful to let go. It's something we see enshrined in our electoral process, mine in the United Kingdom, yours here in America. It's something that we've enshrined when our leaders are held accountable to the electorate. But it's something that must always be heeded, especially by a country that is the most powerful nation in the world today. With no other country able to hold you to account, your new president must always ensure that the power your country exerts is self-regulating under the law, that the power you have is held for the good of all. This, too, is the message of Magna Carta. Democracy, said Lord Falconer, is not just a process of electing those who govern us. It's also a political philosophy which believes in the critical importance of the rule of law that says we are all equal, with an equal say in how we are governed and with the right to be treated without discrimination. Final words of Magna Carta state, given under our hand in the meadow which is called Runnymede, between Windsor and Staines, on the 15th day of June in the 17th year of our reign. In that meadow today are two memorials linking that event with your country. One is a rotunda built by the American Bar Association to acknowledge the importance of Magna Carta. The other is a tribute to John F. Kennedy, standing on an acre of land presented to the people of the United States. And on this memorial, an inscription from his address in 1961. We shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend or oppose any foe in order to assure the survival and success of liberty. I've entitled this lecture, To Have But Not To Hold. The meaning perhaps has become obvious. 
as possessor of such a treasure as Magna Carta, I and my colleagues at Lincoln Cathedral are aware of the power such an iconic document has to inspire, to inform, and to restrain. I've already spoken of the care we must take with such a precious document. So in a literal sense, it is something to have but not to hold. But figuratively, this applies also. We have a duty to share this and our other treasures, especially to engender that interest and awareness of past, present, and future that this document is able to inspire. We should be criminally mean if we were to keep it to ourselves. When our world is searching and seeking for truths by which to guide humanity, the truth of freedom under the law is something we all need to hear, and for some parts of our world, it will offer a hope hardly dreamt of. None of what I say is to elevate law to the status of God. As a Christian minister, I acknowledge the limitations of law before the gifts of grace. But unlike the laws of the Medes and the Persians, our laws can properly be changed by the democratic process through proper legislation. Yet it is essential that those laws that we do adopt and accept should be held in respect and obedience for the good of all people. To have, but not to hold, has a sting in its tail. For we've acknowledged that in both our countries, we own an inheritance of freedom and democracy with this common ancestry of Magna Carta. If we do indeed have such an inheritance, we are all the more guilty if we do in fact fail to hold it, if we espouse its freedoms, but deny them to others. So let me conclude with words again from President Ronald Reagan, when talking of this document, Magna Carta, and the subsequent documents, the children, if you like, that it has spawned. He said, these documents speak with a force far greater than all the armies that have ever marched. The force of the love of freedom that is born with the birth of every living soul. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.